So I'd like to welcome to the stage our penultimate session of the, uh, of the Practical AI track. Uh, it's Jack, uh, Jack from IGP Games to talk about how IGP Games leveraged AI to rebuild IGP Jet Manager. So thank you, Jack. So some of you might like Netflix shows with similar titles to this, but um, we are a formula racing game and it's a manager game. It's all online. You can have up to 32 teams in a league. I'm the CEO of the company, obviously, as you can see. This is my first time on a stage, and I haven't rehearsed this. So if it's a train wreck, don't be surprised. At least it'll be entertaining. OK, so this is where we're at today. This, the state of AI right now is essentially the best you can do, really, is use projects and feed it knowledge. Or you can fine tune a model. And that's slightly more advanced, but if you've used projects, there's Claude, for example, you can feed it um, knowledge about your game, text files. Uh, ChatGPT started off with GPTs, custom GPTs, and now they've got projects as well. So basically, that is all you can squeeze out of them right now. And the current limitations are the context windows. You're constantly recreating the context window of every single prompt. So I'm starting from the basics here. Some of you may already know this, but when you begin with these chat models, no matter how many files you give them, every time you prompt them, the prompt is being generated on the fly, and it's just a long prompt every time you give it a message. So where are we headed this year? So soon we've got AI agents. I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about that here today. Um, autonomy, that's where they'll, these agents will be able to go off and perform multiple tasks for you. And I think with this will come simpler prompting, so you won't need to um, We'll get into this later, but you won't need to structure your prompts as much and be as um, detailed in the information that you give it. You'll probably be able to say at some point, make me a Mario Kart game with me and my friends in it, and it will just go and do that. But we're not there yet. So I, I do think that's going to arrive very fast, though. I think in the next year, we're going to see massive leaps in what these tools can do. And there's talk of AGI and ASI. I think we could see that towards the end of the year as well. Uh, I'm quite ambitious, I think, on the timelines. I think. In two years, we're basically all screwed. <laughs> I think um, AI is just going to take most jobs. I had a chat with Dave about this recently, actually, for the um, newsletter. And uh, you, you mentioned a figure 40% of jobs might go to AI. I think that's conservative, honestly. I think in, in the next three to five years, it's, it's just going to yeah, scorched earth situation. <laughs> and we're going to have to readjust the economy and figure out what's going on, because nothing like this has ever happened. We never had an intelligence explosion like this. I will just say on that last point about AGI and ASI, OpenAI seem very bullish right now. They're talking a lot about um, AGI, and they've already moved their focus to ASI. So at least that's what they're saying. We'll see. I mean, they have to sell a product, so maybe there's a lot of hype there, but let's see. So where's this going in the future? Um, there's some good, good demos right now of generative gaming, where these games are not even running on a game engine. It's essentially real-time video generation. And Google, it's not technically Google, but it's a lot of people from Google, built this one called Game Engine. And that is able to replicate the game Doom. And it, as far as you can tell, I mean, I haven't played it myself, but it looks completely like the game Doom. And it's all just based on training data. It just knows what Doom looks like, what's probably going to happen in the game Doom. And it simulates it really well. It's unbelievable. And Genie 2 is a slightly more advanced model, which has full open worlds you can generate from a text prompt. So you can say, I want an open world with a robot character that looks like Super Mario. And, a, and Pikachu is his companion or something. And it can generate that, at least for a, a time. Um, it's still early days, so we're seeing that a lot of what you see in the text models as well, a lot of hallucination, a lot of difficulty um, with, with sort of memory, memorizing the world. So you'll turn away from an object, turn back, and it may have distorted slightly or even changed into something completely different. Um, so that is a, a current limitation, but again, who knows how quickly we'll get past that. We'll have to just wait and see. And Oasis AI is actually a Minecraft clone, which you can play online right now. If you search for Oasis AI, you can play that in your browser on your phone. Um, but don't do it while I'm talking, please. <laughs> Wait until I finish. But yeah, it's, um, it's surprisingly good. But again, you'll see this problem where you turn away from an object, you come back, it's turned into something else. One moment you're in a cave, the next you've turned and you're in a field, you know? Because it just connects what is there now to what might be there. It doesn't have any sort of persistent memory. That's the main issue. But once those issues are resolved, 
where do we go? I mean, uh, the matrix? <laughs> I don't know. I can see a world where we're all just strapped into our headsets in our little pods, and maybe the AIs are running the show. I don't, I don't know. We're just going to have to wait and see. It's, it's one of those things. So here's back to reality and the, the present day. How do we use AI IGP games? So we use it for code, obviously. Um, lots of us are doing that now, chat GPT. Claude's probably the, the best, I would say, 3.5 Sonnet. Um, images, video, audio. You can do generative audio now with um, Eleven Labs. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. But you, you can also do sound effects with that. So it's great if you just say like a ping sound for a, a cash register or something, you can generate that on Eleven Labs as well. I know everybody knows about the voice, but not everyone's using the sound effects tools as well. Um, video generation, I've kind of touched on the issues with that on the previous slide where it, it can only really do five seconds of usable footage. Beyond that, you start to get a lot of issues and you have to kind of make the scenes, even in the five second clips, not too lively because if too much is going on, they tend to hallucinate a lot. Um, yeah, we're also using it for brainstorming. I found it really useful for this. So if there's a feature you want to add to your game, you can run it by ChatGPT. We've actually got a, um, a kind of special tuned GPT for this purpose that's just a game designer. And we use that to bounce ideas off it. And it, it's knowledgeable about the game as well. It's, it's got a full kind of game uh, fact inside it, so it understands frequently asked questions. Um, use it for writing, obviously. I think everyone's doing this for blogs and so on. So in the rebuild of IGP Manager, we've used AI for everything. You can see with the isometric HQ in the top left corner, it's um, used a combination of scenario, magnific, mid-journey, Photoshop. The funny thing is you take these generations from scenario, which I find the most useful for isometrics, by the way. If you try that on mid-journey, it's always a little bit skew if it doesn't quite do it. So scenario is good because it, it tends to enforce the angles and the correct dimensions. So you take something from there, you'll often find it still has issues, like the door might look a bit wobbly or something, and then you take it to Photoshop and select that area and just say, a door, and it will give you some options. And it's easy to actually tidy up AI with AI. You don't have to spend a lot of time doing it manually. We've also got an AI assistant built in game, which is trained on all the game guides. It's kind of built off the same principles as the game designer that I mentioned previously. So a lot of the learnings there fed into this. It's, it's trained on our game guides. And we quite quickly hit the limit of what you can do with the context windows. It's, it will connect strange concepts. I think I've got another slide on this. I might come back to this in a minute. But what you find is they connect things in a way that we don't. Because we understand, for example, a steering wheel is not the same as a wheel that has a tire on it. But you may find the AI starts to link the concepts via wheel and thinks you can put a tire on a steering wheel, just as an abstract example. It, it doesn't understand physics or anything like that. It's just connecting words. So there are limits. Uh, we built a cache system as well. Because our game is actually a hybrid app. It's a HTML app when you're in the management pages. And then it launches into Unity for the native content. So for the cache system, we've actually built um, a way to pre-cache all the screens on the website, essentially. And Claude wrote that. I, I just said, I, I need a cache system. It was something I've wanted to do for years, but technically was very difficult and a bit beyond my capabilities. But I said to Claude, I'd like to do this. And it says, oh, you can use IDP cache in the browser. And da -da -da -da. there you go. Yeah, that saved me months of work right there. So, and we found that so many areas of the game, it's just so powerful for those kind of tasks, as long as you give it clear instructions. Um, so yeah, refactoring code as well is another thing. If you've got big, messy blocks of spaghetti code, it's great to feed it to the AI and say, is there a way to refactor this? And give it, again, I'll probably go on to this in a later slide, so I'll come back to that. There's two ways forwards as far as I see it right now. There's speed or there's building a moat. Now, we've gone for the moat approach. Right now, I think speed is a great approach, but I think it's going to be very short-lived. So speed is where you just prototype rapidly, deploy and release often, uh, and you're prospecting for gold, essentially. So you're trying to find those little niches that maybe someone hasn't captured yet. A great one I saw recently was a tool called Cal AI, which is a, a, a kid, as far as I can tell, has built an app where you just photograph your dinner and say how many calories is in that. If you've used calorie trackers, you know it can be painful putting in all the ingredients. So although I don't think that's going to give you an accurate calorie count, it's, it's a good opportunity they've capitalized on, and he's done really well with that. So those are the kind of speedy opportunities, I would say, are here in the short term. But I don't think that's going to last long. Right, like I've said, I think the rate of acceleration on this is going to be such that in a year or two, 
the only survivors will be those with a moat because AI will just be able to replicate anything that's simple enough for it to do so, especially once we get to the agent era. So how to get started with these tools? I've given three approaches. So if you're a beginner and you really aren't too familiar with doing anything other than asking chat GPT questions, I would say start using projects. It will give you much better answers and um, generate media too. So generate videos and, and images. It will give you a good understanding of how these tools work and what the current limitations are. If you're at an intermediate level, so you're a coder, perhaps you've already done projects and stuff but you want to know how to go further, I would say build a chatbot. It will teach you even more about limits of context windows and how to build good prompts because that's essential to working with these tools in the current state. If you're more advanced, I would say then create a fine-tuned model but you're going to need thousands of examples of Q and A's um, on top of, it's essentially a chatbot on steroids really so you're going to want to um, give it as many Q, Q and A's as you can about the project and it will give better answers then. So back to the point about prompting, prompts really do matter, it's not insignificant, there's this, I think again this is a slightly temporary opportunity but there's obviously prompt engineers you've probably heard of now, it's a thing, I don't think it's going to last for long but at the moment it's critical to get your prompts right because of the limits of these context windows and what the models can actually handle, getting the right input is so key as it says up there, garbage in, garbage out. If you have a bad prompt, it's not going to give you a good answer. And context is key, so map out the context, the dependencies, give it blueprints, not your visions. So don't say, I would like to build something that does X, Y, Z. Say, I'm building on a Linux Ubuntu server using um, a LAMP stack and my code practices are X, Y, Z. Could you write me something that adheres to these principles that does Z. So then you've got your much more refined answer. It'll be a much better output. It's just one example of how you can do that. And the Goldilocks zone. I would say if you give it too much information, it can actually clutter the context window. That's where my example earlier about the, the wheel situation comes in. If you're feeding it <coughs> pages and pages of information, it can start to link concepts which are not linked in reality. And if you give it too little info, obviously I've touched on that, it's, it's going to be too vague. So essentially, this. If you've got an hour to think about a problem, spend most of the time thinking about how to structure your prompt or the question really, and then the answer will just come out on the first go. So actually, I think we missed a video. Can we, is there a video? I'll go, it should have been a couple of slides ago, yeah. This is just something that we generated. You will need to put it on loop. It's only a, it's one of these five second clips. But yeah, this is an example of something that I've generated using. Um, it's a combination of tools. So that's actually the car from our game. So our players would recognize it as our car. It's not just a generic car that's been thrown in. There's obviously some issues. This shows the limits of the models currently. You'll see there's some distortions over here, like that, that person just materialized from nowhere. There's a few issues over there as well, but your focus is here, so the important bit is right. Um, but this is about as good as you're going to get at the moment out of these models. It's, it's a real stretch to get something this clean out of it. Um, what tool did I use for that? I think it was, um, oh, I can't remember the name. I'll let you know at the end if there's a, <laughs> jog my memory at the end. But yeah, that's, that's the state of the art on videos right now. Can we go back to the slides? So yeah, conclusions. I think abundance is incoming. Robot labor, AI problem solving, robo taxis, abundant energy through solar and nuclear. Um, and I'd say the era of play is here. That's where I think this is going to go. So games are just going to explode. Like w before we had to work, what did we all do? We played games, you know, as kids. I think we're not going to have to work so much in the future. That's where I see this going. Um, it's going to be a dangerous time. It's not going to be plain sailing to get there, we're not just going to go, yay, let's play. It's going to be a case of figuring out all the bits in between and probably going to need UBI and some other things to sustain society, I would say. It's going to be really turbulent. But I don't see any reason why this doesn't eventually end up with games being one of the biggest things that we do as humans. Essentially that. <laughs> the era of work, I'd say, is over and the era of play is about to begin. Thank you.
Great. Thank you very much, Jack. That was excellent. And we've got, uh, got a few minutes, I think, for, yeah. for questions. So do we have any questions from the, uh, the audience? I'll tell you what, I'll get us started. Yeah. Um, you mentioned this earlier on, and I'd be interested to know. You, um, there was uh, the in-game assistant, yeah. right, the, the helper. You, you give uh, a, a, essentially a, a chat function, the details of the game when it can answer yeah. questions. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? What's the, the thinking there and the benefits of having that system? Yeah, it's, it's the early stages of what we see as uh, NPCs that will be built on these systems as well. So it's a way to sort of get our toes in the water, start to experiment, understand how these systems work. And that's why I said it's a great example, because I learned so much in that process of building that, about how these tools work, what the current limits are. And that's why I would strongly recommend it. But yeah, the, the thinking is we start with an assistant. In the future, why can't that be your driver in a post-race interview? Yeah. You know, why can't you have a, a post-race debrief with your team and your chief designers there in our game and your driver and so on? Yeah, perfect. That, sound, that sounds great. Yeah. Also, I've got to, I guess uh, if anyone has a question, put your hands up. But I, the, the other thing I was going to ask is you're obviously, the, your game has been in existence for many years. I think yeah, you've, you've yeah. recently celebrated an anniversary, right? It's over 13 years. Yeah, 13 it, years. There's a browser game, and then I think it's five or six in the app stores now. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm amazing. And you've recently pivoted to using these AI tools to, mm. to, to rebuild the game and, and yeah. change direction. Culturally, was that a difficult thing to do? You, were you and your team have to, you know, was there any pushback from the team? Was there any pushback from the players? Did you have to kind of like rethink how you make the game? Like, as, just as a pivot, yeah. how was that like using to using my? We'll see. We're going to launch it soon. So okay. this is actually coming out at the end of the month. It's not out yet. It right. might be fifth of February. We'll see. But yeah, so that's an exclusive. There you go. Fifth of February. It might be. Yeah, great. But what yeah. about internally? I mean, you, you and your yeah. team. Did you have to, you know, was it a was it a painful process in changing your shed, your own processes? We are so adaptable. And Anyway, and we remote work, so we're not a big office that's had to. I've always said we're like a speedboat, and the, the, this is why we're competing with the Triple A's. You know, we view ourselves as a little speedboat. They're like the Titanic. If they want to change direction and they see an iceberg coming, they, they can't really because they've got to move hundreds of people. Um, in our company, it's so nimble. It's essentially I just make the decision, and then that's where we go. So, yeah, good, good quite good. straightforward. Um, we've got a, a minute or two before we change things for the, the panel. Do we have any other questions from, uh, from the audience for, for Jack? No, well, no. in that case, I'll tell you what. Uh, what I suggest is um, next week's AI Game Changers newsletter actually features Jack. So, as you, so you can read more about what he's working on uh, in that. So subscribe through that via, um, I think there's a link on pocketgamer.biz, or you can Google um, AI I think we might Changers. do more games next year. Yeah. This year, sorry. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, thank you very much. A round of applause okay. for, for Jack from IGP Games. Thanks. Thanks.